There was a time once where the visitors of Kanoa's Jurassic World theme park had a smile on their faces. But those quickly vanished during the incident. The incident where all dinosaurs broke free after an enraged T-Rex made its first attempt to escape. Many were eaten by the prehistoric tyrants. Slowly, the remaining survivors took shelter and were evacuated over the following days. Though some dinosaurs continued to roam the abandoned park zone, many herds and groups headed deeper into the island to find a new home of their own. And a new home they found. Deeper into the wilds that were untouched by humanity, lush forests, open plains and crystal clear waters covered the island. They thrived here, and over time, as people back in civilized worlds were arguing about lawsuits, the dinosaurs and life itself found a way. No longer were there only females on the island, and new dinosaurs were born naturally as herds and groups expanded. A whole new ecosystem rose up where all beings played a function. From little critters to species not even revealed to the public. The Pachycephalosaurus was a herbivore that was being bred behind the scenes of the park, but never managed to be released. With the incident, some of the young ones got free. Many new types of creatures were spotted by planes flying over the island to make photos to report on the situation. Many of the herbivores cluttered up together for safety reasons, with the gentle giants like the Brachiosaurus and Diplodocus keeping watch. And in the background, remnants of the once lively park could still be spotted. A single Brachiosaurus walked past some of the facilities that were slowly being overtaken by nature itself. Things were at peace, and there were those believing the best thing to do now is let the dinosaurs keep the island for themselves. The park had no aquatic species, and so there was no chance of the prehistoric animals to cross over to other areas. It seemed as if the island tuned itself to the needs of the dinosaurs, providing a nice environment for almost all types. Though the cranky Ankylosaurus did prefer to be alone and not amongst too many dinosaurs, the little ones with their loud shouts often got on its nerve. Some of the herbivore herds grew to enormous numbers, a few consisted of more than 400 creatures moving from plane to plane for grazing. There were still some feeders left from the park that still offered something to eat as well, though it could in no way provide for the entire herd. But a herd as big as this of course, also attracted predators. Every once in a while, a large carnivore like the T-Rex rushed out in the open to eat an unlucky herbivore. But predators also came in smaller variations like the Baryonyx. Many of the carnivores had also multiplied, but most still remained solo predators. 
duels for hunting grounds were not uncommon. There were even some smaller meat eaters who sometimes dared to challenge a giant like a T-Rex, often with predictable lethal outcomes. But even these predators fitted into this new ecosystem and had their part to play to avoid overpopulation of the herbivores. Though sometimes, a herbivore did manage to get away from the jaws of one of the larger carnivores. Though it was forbidden to set foot on the island by law, several incidents were documented where people did go to the island. Some went for thrill-seeking. Others to snap photos and see the dinosaurs with their own eyes. And some in order to capture or hunt the dinosaurs to sell their teeth, horns, or skin on the black market. Almost all of these ended up badly for the humans. Despite the death toll, those trying to get on the island still continued to try for whatever reason. It was not a place taken lightly. Though it could provide peaceful imagery with quaint groups of herbivores, it was a matter of survival of the fittest. Darwin would be proud. If a herd's larger herbivores were taken out, like the Triceratops, or too many Parasaurs, then often the herd would move, or even merge with another one, to increase their numbers and safety. Larger carnivores hunted their prey for survival and fought fellow predators for turf. But all of it was out of necessity to survive. But there was one anomaly that disturbed this ecosystem. The Indominus Rex, a hybrid artificially created in the lab of Kanoa scientists, was the only known dinosaur not to only kill for food but for sport as well. At first, it seemed to fit well into the entire ecosystem, with the herbivores not paying too much attention to it after it had just ate a hot meal. But where other carnivores did not attack dinosaurs like the Diplodocus or the Brachiosaurus, which were simply too big and a waste for them to eat, the Irax did not seem to care. Multiple occurrences of the Irax slaughtering these giants had been documented and at the rate that the killing continued, the ecosystem would not manage to last.
A first expedition to neutralize the IREX resulted in disaster, with almost the entire team being wiped out. But with the regular hunter's need to feed and look for ever-decreasing prey, things were growing desperate. The Irax killed dozens of helpless dinosaurs daily, often not too far from the hunting grounds of other carnivores. Something had to be done. One particular scientist who worked for Kanoa and managed to evacuate in time during the incident had a rather unconventional solution. After the Indominus Rex had been successfully created, a small part of the team had started to experiment on making another hybrid. The scientists felt that the only way to neutralize the Irex was by sending a new hybrid dinosaur. Let a monster defeat another monster. A team of specialists was being assembled and the humans were once again on their way to the island. As the large expedition team, meant to restore the balance on the island, was on their way, a smaller team went ahead of times to locate and document the dinosaurs for intel purposes. With the dinosaurs heading deeper into the island, it was sometimes difficult to pinpoint each species and a large amount found shelter in the swamp area of the island. The swamp was not too far off from the coast and held its own unique ecosystem with specific flora and fauna types. The area in and of itself came with some advantages to the dinosaurs, both big and little. The first thing was that the area had plenty of water to drink and cool off during a hot day in the sun. Because of all the water, the plant life was rich and robust, offering plants found nowhere else that some particular dinosaurs were very fond of. But a more important reason why so many herbivores chose this area as their nesting ground was the absence of large type predators. The muddy waters made it difficult for them to chase their prey and the thick vegetation surrounding the water worked as the perfect escape route for the herbivores. There were even some of the long-necked dinosaurs, though they were rarer in number. They often preferred the plains as the vegetation and water in the swamp obscured their vision of what was happening directly around them. The safety and thriving dinosaur population resulted in some really rare and never before seen dinosaurs to be documented here. Aerial photos showcase just how thickly populated it was with these magnificent creatures in all shapes and sizes. It was a sight to behold. But all these dinosaurs living so close on top of each other did bring its own share of problems. Fights for territories and nesting grounds did occur amongst the seemingly peaceful herbivores as well. Battles were often long and dragged out, but nevertheless still as fierce as were it with a predator. These battles for territory often ended with one of the herbivores dying of its wounds. Sometimes, all these dinosaurs did feel like one unit, or one herd, despite containing so many different types like the Triceratops or Styracosaurus. Amongst these horned dinosaurs, it was documented that there was one species never before seen in the island which was present at the swamp area. It was the Cynoceratops, an incredible creature 
due to its bolstering size and enormous horn at the front. It was beautiful, and reporters for several magazines seeing footage from aerial photographs of these creatures reinstated the importance of leaving these creatures there on the island after the Indominus had been dealt with. It was another showcase of how life found a way of its own on the island. By now, part of the expedition team had set up camp with giant walls surrounding it for protection. This time, there were more security, science personnel, but also news reporters to keep everyone informed of the expedition. They had ranger teams scout the island to find which areas were safe and to map out the routes to all specific areas surrounding the home base. Part of the ranger team found its way toward the swamp area. Though their vehicle was not meant to traverse water, it was shallow enough to where they could maneuver through it and still get close enough to the dinosaurs. Some of the ranger teams had photographers with them to get good shots for experts to study back at the base. But unfortunately, some of the rangers got a bit overzealous and got too close to the dinosaurs, spooking them with severe consequences for the ranger team. Nevertheless, the overall mood of the dinosaurs was calm. The great mixture of species gave perfect chances for scientists to study dinosaur behavior more and how they interacted with each other. Because of the dense number of creatures, dinosaurs which usually depended on a bigger number of their own type showed signs of less dependency as there were friendly minded herbivores around every corner. But was this biome truly a sign of complete safety for all animals alike? Was there nothing to fear for anyone since the larger predators, like the T-Rex and Spinosaurus, did not come here? No. Even here, death was still lurking in the bushes. But it came in the form of smaller predators as well. The Velociraptor could maneuver fast through the water and stalk their prey. Their smaller size sometimes even gave them an opportunity to move through a herd unnoticed as it was packed with cluttered up dinosaurs. Overall, the raptors were only a real threat to the smaller creatures, though you had occasions where one of the raptors got too cocky and found itself in a standoff with a big adversary. Often this ended up with the raptor turning away, as it knew it could not win. But then at the same time, it was documented that it could take down some of the bigger herbivores who did not possess a direct way of defending themselves like a Triceratops or Stegosaurus. But most of the bigger dinosaurs did not seem to care for the small carnivores. They were the problems of the smaller herbivores, who had the advantage of easily being able to hide in the bushes and vegetation. But even though apex predators did not roam here, it did not mean it was completely safe either. A particular carnivore, the Carnotaurus, was smaller and more agile than your average T-Rex and could maneuver through the swamp area with ease. It used the vegetation as cover when sneaking up close to its prey. The Carnotaur had up until then not been documented in the park that got previously destroyed. Either scientists had already worked on the Carnotaur genome or some other explanation had to be found.
Besides the swamp area with its herbivores being a source of food, it was also a rich source of drinking water. As much as it was for the plant eaters. But since the Carnotaur was not as powerful as some of its bigger brothers and sisters, it was not uncommon for it to lose a fight against some of the herbivores which could defend themselves well. But despite the dangers, it paled in comparison to some of the other areas where the Indominus or other more giant predators roamed and gave an overall relaxing and pleasant atmosphere. Life really settled in more than other areas, and people knew that this would be a popular spot among scientists for research purposes. Who knows what secrets and discoveries could be made by studying the animals' patterns and behaviors. But one should also not forget the true reason the humans went back to the island. It was to stop the Indominus from killing too many animals and disturbing the ecosystem. To counter this, one of Kanoa's scientists had previously informed him that a new hybrid would be brought to the island. The night before, on an island a few miles from the one where the park was built, the hybrid was showcased to officials and army generals for the first time. The new hybrid was known as the Indoraptor. It was a hybrid between the Velociraptor and the Indominus Rex, the one that was used in the gladiator fight back in the park. The dark of night reduced the Indoraptor to nothing more than a silhouette, but people were amazed by the ferocity of this new creature. Soon, it would be unleashed and face its nemesis, the Indominus Rex. As the days went by, more and more people, part of the research team, security, and reporters, arrived on the island at the home base. The facility grew and expanded, and it became quite lively all around the living quarters. Each member had their own designated section, with the scientists and security giving out reports in a specific press area. The entire world tuned in on the news to follow the latest developments on the island. The entrance of the base camp had been secured by large fences on either side. It resembled almost a tunnel, and whenever an expedition team headed out to scout ahead, they would leave from this area. Luckily for the crew and people back at the camp, this area was mostly populated with bigger herbivores like the Stegosaurus. For scouting further ahead, to places like the swamp area or the plains where the main herd roamed, the people often resorted to scouting by helicopter. Every now and then, they would come across a dangerous predator like a single Spinosaurus. Luckily, they did not get too close to the base, and would tranquilize their darts. Predators that came too close were moved further away from the base. Despite this well-organized system, 
it did not mean that the team of specialists that were sent out to the island did not deal with setbacks. There was the one time when the Stegosaurus had walked into the base by accident. Though it did not intentionally attack anyone, it got startled by this weird environment and in its panic it did trample a few members stationed in the base to death. The rangers of the helicopter team were quick to respond though and put the beast down before it could do any major damage to more people in the facilities. It was moved again to avoid a similar scenario. Another incident occurred during a scouting run by one of the helicopter teams. Up until this point, all helicopter runs went without any trouble. But one team got too close to the holding pens where the flying creatures were being held back in the park. The sound of the helicopter startled the animals and they attacked the helicopter which ended in some fatal results. Weather on the island could also be quite unpredictable, but the most they suffered were some rough wind gushes and heavy raindrop. Then another incident involved an attack on the base camp by a nearby carnivore. It was rare for carnivores to come so close to the base, let alone enter the small path leading up to the entrance. One would really think they should be thinking about putting a giant gate or door there. That day, a scouting party was sent out that got the scare of their life when they ran into the jaws of the evenly surprised Carnotaurus. Once again, similar to the incident involving the Stegosaurus, the Carnotaurus was mostly just confused and scared about this artificial place he had walked into. Weird things he had never seen before, weird smells he had never smelled before, and loud noises made her want to get the hell out of there, and in that process, many people got trampled underneath its paws. The ranger team was on it again, but the target was more mobile and smaller than the previous encountered Stegosaurus. It took several minutes before enough darts could be shot into the dinosaur to put it down. In the end, the Carnotaur made her own way outside, dazed by the trank darts. She bit all around her, snapping at some unlucky members of the team. Though most of the fatalities happened due to being squashed, there were a few cases of people who were devoured by its snapping jaws. But after the tragic events at the park, the members who arrived at the island knew that this could happen. They all signed a waiver mentioning no one could be held responsible for injury or death other than themselves. But the biggest incident of all occurred not too long after that. The Indoraptor had been sedated and moved to this part of the island to get ready to be sent out to fight the Indominus Rex. This time, other scientists beside the ones of the highest rank got a good look at this new hybrid. Everyone who laid their eyes upon it saw how deadly it was. A perfect killing machine. You could look in its eyes and see it figuring stuff out. Immediately it was trying to find opportunities to escape its pen. But security had learned from their mistakes at the park previously. Where they only had used the most simple kind of fencing back then, this time they had heavy electrified fences built around the creature. The Indoraptor tried a couple of times to escape by attacking the fence, much like the T-Rex had done in the park, but it was for naught. The interesting detail though was that every time the Indoraptor attacked, it attacked a different area of the fence never the same place twice. But disaster struck when one day a sudden storm formed over the island. They had to deal with bad weather before, but this was unlike anything they had dealt with. A small tornado soared through the camp, 
picking off people, vehicles, and parts of the buildings alike. Communications were down, buildings collapsed, and many parts of the base were without power now. And that small detail was also noted by the Indoraptor. It did not take long before it noticed that the power was out and it ripped itself through the thick metal bars. It snuck up on the security and science personnel assigned to its pen. Due to communications being out, the security were unable to call in help before it was too late. Then it did not take long for the Indoraptor to make its way to the main area of the camp. As people started to notice that the Predator was loose, the weather cleared up as well. But help was still far out. They had no contact with other outposts across the island, and many of the rangers were wounded or scrambled within the chaos. They had no choppers that could fly. They were completely on their own. And the Indoraptor loved it. The carnivore was artificially made and spent most of its time in test labs in small areas. Having this much space felt exhilarating, and though it too did not understand what exactly was going on, unlike the Stegosaurus in Carnotaur, the Indoraptor did not panic. Part of the wall had been destroyed by the tornado, and some team members had ran through the jungle far from the home base. But the Indoraptor did not pursue them, and instead made a quick stop to find a spot to drink. The chaos of the storm had also drove some of the nearby Stegosaurus towards the base. A similar display of the earlier incident occurred once more, as some helpless people met their end underneath the running giants. The Indoraptor did not seem to care that much and continued to explore the area and eat a delicious snack here and there. It grew an accustomed taste to human flesh, and with every kill, it wanted more and more. Eventually, the Indoraptor and a single Stegosaurus did end up facing off against one another. The result was pretty predictable. Though the Indoraptor showed its impressive fighting power, it did not get out of the battle unscathed, and the spikes on the Stegosaurus' tail left deep bloody marks on the face of the Indoraptor. Power was still down but a checkup squad from a nearby base had arrived after the weather had cleared up, and one of the helicopter teams tried its best to sedate the Indoraptor. Finding the Indoraptor was one thing, as it was quite small if it traveled on all fours. Eventually it was spotted, and the team hastily tried to take it down. It was incredibly fast dodging a lot of the Trank darts shot at it. Eventually it was taken down, but not before it could end a lot more people's lives before succumbing to the chemicals in the Trank dart. Then by transport chopper, the Indoraptor was lifted towards a more secure pen, and the research team would spend the next few days rebuilding what was lost. Hey everybody, before we start today's episode, I would like to inform you that recently I started a new similar dinosaur documentary style series called Planet Ark. Much like we do during Season 2 of Jurassic World Evolution, we take a closer look at all of the giant beasts on the ground, in the air, and under the water in episodes with each their own particular biome as a topic. The first episode is already out and gives a glimpse of all the cool areas, creatures, and things to expect. The link to this episode can be found in the description down below. If you are a fan of this Jurassic World Evolution series, 
Be sure to check out my Planet Arc series as well, as I'm sure that there are many similarities that you will like. Thanks again for the huge support in this series, and enjoy the episode. A few weeks after the incident involving the Indoraptor escape, things had returned to normal again at the base camp. The Indoraptor was recaptured, damages to buildings were repaired, and bodies that were able to be recovered were sent back home. Though the sight of the Indoraptor frightened some, a few others, mainly reporters who stood at a safe distance when the incident occurred, convinced many viewers of the potential it had to battle the Indominus Rex. Thus, the next step was to locate the Indominus Rex and to unleash the Indoraptor. One particular area that experts believed they had a high chance of spotting the Indominus would be the plains. The plains that held the largest herd on the island. It was a real sight to behold. Hundreds of dinosaurs, many different species, all came together in the clearing where they grazed, drank, played, and slept. The plains were so vast that though there were so many dinosaurs currently there, wandering dinosaurs could still find quieter places if the chaos got a bit too much. It was apparent that the long-necked dinosaurs preferred the plains as they had the largest number of them compared to the forest and swamp areas. Many believed it was for the good visibility it brought with it. But smaller dinosaurs also preferred being in this big herd. It was almost as if they disappeared within all the ruckus around them. Small patches could be seen playing and sparring it out against one another. Packs of Struthiomimus interacted with one another at the edge of the water strip. It seemed that interaction between the dinosaurs in general was far more common here compared to the forest, swamp, and beach area. The openness of the field probably made this the perfect environment. Dinosaurs that were at the center of the group did not have to worry about watching for predators, since those situated at the edge were functioning as lookouts. But this did create a hierarchy in species, but also for the best and safest nesting grounds. And with hierarchy comes conflict. Though it was common for smaller dinosaurs to play and fool around, for larger dinosaurs like the Triceratops, dangerous duels were being fought out daily for rights to nesting grounds or the dominant male. Sometimes these battles even had fatal consequences. This was rare though. Most battles would be over once one of the Triceratops was wounded but could still walk. The losing one often was pushed to the side of the herd until another opportunity would arise to fight for a spot once more. These issues were no such matter for species like the Gallimimus. And though the large amount of animals can be a bit startling at first, once you look closely, the personality of individual dinosaurs can be easily studied. The densest section of the herd centered around a drinking spot, not surprising and comparable to regular animal behavior in places like Africa. Similar to the swamp area though, the dense population resulted in certain types 
like the Stereochosaurus, to be comfortable roaming alone despite being normally dependent on being in a close proximity of likewise dinosaurs. The Parasaurolophus was among the most common dinosaurs found, heavily dependent on the herd's presence as it could not properly defend itself. On a hot summer day, some of the dinosaurs could be found spending time inside the water to cool off. On days like these, the plains did not offer much shelter to smaller types like the chunking osaurus. As the water often was treaded by different dinosaurs alike, it was not very pristine or clean as is, but it did the job for most of the animals. And still as mentioned before, though the overall atmosphere was that of a peaceful herd, smaller conflicts duels, and battles continued amongst many different dinosaurs. Even the smaller Taurosaurus, that could not prove such a spectacular display as their Triceratops counterpart, had their own issues to fight out. But the one particular dinosaur that had the bloodiest duels among the herd were the Stegosaurus. Battles for mating rights, nesting grounds, or dominance often resulted in grave wounds and were usually decided with only one or two swings from their tail. Though their tail spikes were an effective weapon, it lacked pinpoint accuracy and thus often lashed out ferociously at one another. It was common for a Stegosaurus to be fatally hit and succumbing from its wounds. Yes, in a place where the population was this dense, tensions could rise amongst the peaceful herbivores. Luckily, though conflicts were reoccurring, deaths were rare and far between. Certain dinosaurs that did not like the crowded areas, but did prefer the safety in numbers like the Ankylosaurus, often grazed at a more secluded area away from the drinking spot. But as mentioned before, the dinosaurs standing around the outer perimeter had an extra function of being spotters for danger. Though this area was bustling with life and thriving on the presence of so many dinosaurs, it also attracted the attention of larger predators, including the sought-after Indominus Rex. But the Indominus Rex, though spotted before hunting and roaming the plains before the dinosaurs were forced to relocate, had not been seen in the last couple of days. Instead, other incidents involving predators like the Ceratosaurus had been documented. But the interesting part was that though the Ceratosaurus came here to feed and drink, the entire herd did not run into the forest immediately when the carnivore had been spotted. Some even had more eye for each other as duels were being fought out with the carnivores leaving them to their match. Instead, the herd then stopped, realizing the strength in numbers increased the chances of not being picked individually as a meal. For some of the weaker-minded dinosaurs who stepped too close to the herd's outer area, this proved to be the case.
but also other predators were attracted to the herd in plains. They were often of the larger kind, with the raptors and dinonychus preferring the thick vegetation of the swamps. Here on the plains, carnivores that excelled in strength could use their strong legs at their full potential. Nevertheless, if a carcass was found among the herd from a previous carnivore hunt or lost duel, they would never say no to that. Even the giant T-Rex female had been spotted hunting the plains and be given the same rather passive treatment like the other carnivores had. Though they did not spot the Indominus Rex, it was decided to unleash the Indoraptor around this area as it did attract the apex predators. Maybe the presence of a new hybrid could even be sensed and would be a reason for the Indominus to show itself. The unleashing of the Indoraptor was a big spectacle and many people had assembled when the creature was set free. It was documented live on television. But having this many people around was a terrible mistake. Where the people thought that the Indoraptor would see all those herbivores and go for an immediate kill there, instead it remembered the taste of human flesh and first turned towards the people who had assembled there. The safe distance the people thought they had was quickly overcome by the Indoraptor as it started biting into the larger group of people who scrambled into the forest. A handful of men and women died once more to the jaws of the Indoraptor. It was a tragedy that could have easily been avoided and thus, in the future, reporters and other non-essential personnel would not be so close to the dinosaurs when they would be released into the wild. After completing its carnage, the Indoraptor finally got eye for the herd in the distance. It hurried itself towards the new area to explore and see what it had to offer. It would need some time to adjust and learn how to hunt its new prey, but in due time, the Indoraptor would make this place its home. The Indoraptor had finally been released into the wild, and experts would monitor its behavior as it got used to being around other dinosaurs. While this occurred, hunters headed out to look for any signs of the Indominus Rex. From the skies above, scientists saw that the Indoraptor was a bit apprehensive at first when being introduced to other dinosaurs, some of which were bigger than itself. But those who designed the Indoraptor had come up with a mechanism to pinpoint the dinosaur towards the target and attack it. They demonstrated this during the reveal of the Indoraptor to their heads of finance. Before attacking something like the Indominus, many believed that the Indoraptor needed some training first. It had never faced off against other dinosaurs before, except for the Stegosaurus back during the escape incident. They made sure that its first target would be one of the predators found at the plains. Though giants like the T-Rex and Spinosaurus sometimes appeared here, some medium-sized ones could be found too, and they proved to be the perfect sparring partner for the Indoraptor. Besides just learning to fight big predators, the carnivores in and around the plains also had another function. They showcased the Indoraptor how to hunt larger herbivores for food.
Up until that point, the Indoraptor had only hunted goats and humans, and this was definitely of another caliber. The Indoraptor itself, luckily, did not show signs that it killed for sport, unlike the Irax. With each passing day, the Indoraptor explored new areas further away from the plains, including the swamp area. Here, it would face smaller and quicker enemies like the Velociraptor. Though size-wise, it could not compare, and therefore really function as a proper training fight for when it would face the Indominus, it did teach the Indoraptor of the different capabilities that different dinosaurs had. The Indoraptor seemed to prefer the swamps over the plains. Its smaller and more horizontal oriented posture probably attributed to this fact. Over the next couple of weeks, it was not startled of any of the creatures it encountered anymore. Some dinosaurs, like the Baryonyx, were not initially scared of the Indoraptor, as its size when it was on all fours was not all that impressive. But it did not take long before the Indoraptor noticed the dominant behavior towards it, and would not just stand by as it rose to the top of the food chain with each week. After this attack, no other Baryonyx challenged the Indoraptor, but this first one had to pay for its mistake with its life. But the scientists wanted the Indoraptor to return to the plains to face against bigger opponents closer resembling the Indominus Rex. By using the guiding mechanism, they lured its way back towards the plains right at the time when a Spinosaurus came here to drink. The difference in size was staggering. The Spinosaurus made such an imposing and threatening impression next to the Indoraptor. Some of the scientists believed that the Indoraptor was not ready yet to face such a massive nemesis. But the mechanism was used to unleash the fight anyway. The Indoraptor had learned from its fight with the Velociraptor earlier. In a reverse move, it was the smaller Indoraptor that hopped onto the back of the larger predator and brought it to its knees. The scientists were stunned. Now it was ready to face the Indominus, everyone thought. They did not know it yet back then, 
but the Innoraptor would soon be sent towards the island labeled by the rangers as Cloud Nine. It was a small island in the middle of a lake west of the plains and swamp and thanked its name due to its shape similar to that of a nine. Others often joked that it resembled more of a six. The landmass was tiny and the place itself was fairly isolated, making it perfect for some smaller herbivores to make it their habitat. Creatures like the Taurosaurus, but also the Dracorex, made this island their home. The Dracorex could be found sporadically in other parts as well, including the swamp. They were part of the Pachycephalosaurus family, though made a less impressionable sense of being built like a battering ram, like Apache was. Larger herbivores sometimes came to the center of the island to drink. Its waters were a lot clearer than the lake water surrounding it. Predators were also bound to loom along the edge, trying to find an opportunity of catching drinking prey off guard. But then, a few months after the Indoraptor had been released, a ranger finally reported he spotted the Indominus Rex at Island Cloud 9. The Indominus was spotted drinking and hunting and seemed to never get too far from the island. It took so long and so much effort to find the Indominus Rex that in their enthusiasm of finding it, the ranger team left out that there was something oddly different about the Indominus Rex. Once the Indoraptor was lured to the island, it immediately hid in the bushes. It understood well and quick that this dinosaur it saw was not an ordinary one, that it was somewhat similar like the Indoraptor was. The Indoraptor showing signs of fear or being intimidated worried some of the scientists, but the Indominus got into a fight with a smaller Taurosaurus. Though the Indominus easily won, the little three-horned creature did manage to hit the carnivore in its side, giving the Indoraptor an advantage if it needed it. Shortly after, the Indoraptor was prompted to attack the Indominus Rex. The two stared at each other. On first glance, the Indominus Rex was not faced too bad by its initial attack. As the battle was going on, the scientists and rangers back at the camp got a message they could not believe. A couple of miles north, another ranger team spotted two dinosaurs that they believed were Indominus Rex as well. They were seen moving together from place to place. Once they heard the news, everyone stayed silent. How was this possible? The alarms were raised all over the island from the moment the news was released that multiple Indominus Rex had been spotted on the island. How was this possible? Because the dinosaurs were created with frog DNA it explained why other dinosaur species had thrived on the island and were able to produce offspring. But for this process, one still had to have at least two dinosaurs present. That was not the case at first with the Indominus Rex. When scientists took a closer look at the database concerning the details on which species the hybrid consisted of, the answer was found. Though the Indominus Rex was a hybrid between multiple dinosaurs, it had also been implemented with DNA of other animals including tree frogs, cuttlefish and more. These explain some of the Irex's attributes like the ability to camouflage. Now though it was rare, there have been documented evidence that there are certain types of animals that can breed and produce offspring without the need of a male. 
Amongst those animals are stick insects, certain lizards, sawfish, and also snakes, including the pit viper snake, which was used in the creation of the Indominus Rex. The pit viper snake has the ability to produce offspring through a process labeled parthenogenesis. The scientists believed that this explained the Indominus having produced offspring, but also explained why the rangers had not been able to find the Indominus at a regular hunting grounds. She most likely looked for a secure location to raise her children until they were big enough to hunt on their own. The amount of Indominus young had still need to be determined, but up until now, at least five had been counted for. Initially, the young were of an old enough age to where the mother would let them hunt in areas like the swamp. The younglings never stood too far from one another, but they did show signs of independence. When they would feel hungry, they would individually go after a certain prey instead of waiting to be served. With this behavior, the scientists noted down something remarkable. Though the mother taught the young to kill, they interpreted this only as killing for food, while she still continued to kill other dinosaurs for no reason. A somewhat normal raising in the natural environment contributed to this, many believed. Because of that, the Indominus younglings fitted in perfectly with the island's ecosystem and creature hierarchy. Therefore, it was not long after that a statement was released that the Indominus younglings could thrive on the island as equals to all the other dinosaur species with the exception of the mother. For now, the ranger's main mission was still to take her out. The Indominus rex that was facing the Indoraptor was one of these offspring. One could clearly see that this was indeed not the cruel Indominus they were looking for. It had not even learned how to properly fight. The targeting mechanism had already been instated for the Indoraptor to attack. Therefore, the attack could not be called off, and the Indominus youngling was no match for the fighting threat Indoraptor. The mother had been sighted at the plains amongst the herbivores of the large herd. She had walked here alone, but some of her young ones followed her in pursuit to see what she was doing. The apprehensive behavior at first made it clear to the scientists that this was their first time that they had come to the plains. For the moment, the mother was not showing signs of aggressive or cruel behavior. She was thirsty, and more of her offspring crept closer as they were curious to all these dinosaurs gathered together. It would seem that when the Indominus basic needs took over, it was the only time where she seemed to fit in the ecosystem of the island. A few of the young did not dare come close to the mother, meaning that maybe the mother had shown some aggressiveness even to her own younglings at a certain age, much like some modern animals do. But soon after, the mother's true nature indeed showed itself as the killing resumed. Often the kill she would make would be left on the ground to rot as she was quickly searching for another target. Her young once again were different. Every kill they made, they ate afterward, and would only do so when they were hungry. The group of carnivores had also been noticed by all of the herbivores, and they all cramped up even more to seem like one big unit.
the rangers let it be known that the Indoraptor was being transported towards the plane to face off against the mother. It would need to arrive quick, as the white and dominant female was absolutely ravaging the place with even killing creatures like the Brachiosaurus. Scientists sighed of relief when they saw that the Indoraptor had arrived. Immediately, it was sent to face off against the Indominus. But things did not turn out the way the humans wanted it to. What happened during this fight is argued amongst people choosing different sides. Some said that the Indoraptor was tired after having fought the youngling, but also being transported to and from Island Cloud 9. Others argued that the mother Indominus simply was too tough and had managed to become an absolute killing machine as they had dominated and terrorized the island for a long time since the incident with the park. In the end, it was the Indominus Rex that stood victorious. The Indoraptor, in which the humans put so much faith during the last few weeks, was killed and left in the dirt like trash. They were back at square one, and people were divided about what to do next. Some demanded a new Indoraptor be bred, with even stronger features. Others demanded an Indominus be bred with the same targeting mechanism being implemented to control it to the human's will. But in the end, it seemed nature would come to their aid. As the ground began to shake and tremble, a Tyrannosaurus Rex was approaching, many thought. Much like the gladiator battle back at the park, the T-Rex would surely be able to win again, though that Indominus Rex had not seen or participated in any battles beforehand. But what ran out of the jungle was no T-Rex, and in fact, a dinosaur that had officially not been instated in the park yet back in the day. It was a Gigantosaurus, bigger than a T-Rex, and it seemed out for war. The bright color pattern showcased its dominance and that it was able to catch and devour prey without the need to rely on camouflage. As it saw the Indominus, it even taunted it, angering the Indominus to trigger it to attack. The battle that followed was fierce, and not as one-sided as the previous ones involving the Indoraptor. Though the Gigantosaurus made a fearsome impression, the Indominus held its own for a long while. But in the end, the ferocious jaws of the Gigantosaurus were so powerful and intimidating that the Indominus actually decided to flee. This was witnessed by her young, acknowledging to them that they were now truly independent. She ran a couple of meters, but was soon pursued by the Gigantosaurus that would not let her get away. She had to make her stand here and now and a winner would be decided. It was almost as if the island itself was against her. But the Indominus stood alone. Her times of terror were up. She had produced children that would now be interwoven in their natural habitat and play their natural role. She was the only aberration left, and with a loud snap from the jaws of the Gigantosaurus, the Indominus was finally killed off. With the Indominus' reign of terror finally coming to a close, things would return to normal over the next couple of weeks. The young ones would find their place amongst the others, and dinosaurs would thrive even more on the island than before. It was now the question what role the humans would play in all this. There were some who vowed to rebuild Jurassic Park, even bigger and better than before. Then there were others who said it would be best to leave the dinosaurs be and let life find a way of its own. And then one person stood up who thought of something that would appease both those groups. It was decided that in a couple of weeks, plans would be made to create the first ever 
Dinosaur Safari Park. Hey everybody, and thank you so much for watching all the way through Season 2 of my Jurassic World narrative series. Some of you indeed pointed out how quickly this came after Season 1, and one main reason for this is that the final episode in Season 1 was watched so incredibly well that it became my most popular video of all time. I was very happy to see this series that initially was not very successful, with every episode only having around two or 3,000 views, become such a beloved series on the channel. I was also happy that I was able to do something very different in Season 2 than I did with Season 1. Where Season 1 was really all about the park, this was more about the dinosaurs in their natural habitat, showing off the different biomes, and then of course the introduction of the Indoraptor into the story. Now with Season 2 being over, I am also happy to announce that uh, Season 3 will arrive, but I will take a little bit of a break from the game for a couple of weeks, I think about maybe a month or so. It's just to keep my creativity fresh and try out some other narrative series. If you do like dinosaurs and want to see other cool cinematics on my channels, then please check out the Planet Ark cinematic series, of which the first three episodes are already on my channel. Also a reason for the break is to see what direction Jurassic World Evolution is exactly going. With a park building simulator, there's only so much you can do, even from a creative standpoint. A safari park is something we haven't done yet, and would prove to be a cool mix between Season 1 and 2, and also has the opportunity for some dinosaurs that have not been shown yet, like the Allosaurus, to play a major role in the story. Currently I have 4 episodes in my head ready for Season 3, and I hope to be able to create one more to reach 5. Uh, but I have to admit that after that, I hope that the creators of the game uh, will have released some new DLC that has some new dinosaurs, or have added mod support. As long as the creators keep adding more and more dinosaurs, including maybe new types like water or flying ones, we can have new seasons exploring those and highlighting these awesome new creatures from beautiful camera angles. Anyway, like I always do with these cinematic series, in a couple of days I will be uploading the entire Season 2, meaning it will be an hour-long video. Please share this with those of the Jurassic World Evolution community, as it does help the channel out a lot and hopefully gets more people to watch this series. If there are any other dinosaur type series that you uh, think would make awesome cinematics on this channel, then please also let me know. I already had requests to do videos on the game The Isle, but that is a multiplayer only game, making it a bit difficult to make engaging cinematics. I saw that there are other dinosaur theme park games out there too, and if you guys want to see any of those, that can be done as well. Finally, I want to thank all of you guys for your support throughout the series, and I'm happy that it got picked up and that it brings you all so much joy on what happens on the island. We will take a short little break, but we will be back with exciting new stories in Season 3. In the meantime, please have a look at some of the other cinematics I have to offer on the channel, and I will see you guys next time on Jurassic World.